assessment, her cervix is found to be 2 centimeters, 80% and minus 1 station. She's contracting every 3 minutes. The plan is to administer mag sulfate. First of all, let's discuss that cervix. 2 centimeters, 80% and what does minus 1 mean? Station, okay? Remember with station, Again, a cervical exam, dilation, effacement, and station is subjective. Again, it's the practitioner is doing the exam. What you're going to find with station is that when you do a, pel a pelvic exam, these are the ischial spines. You're measuring the head as it comes down into the pelvis. So once that head is at the ischial spines, we're saying that the, the baby is at zero station. If the baby is higher, you do minus 1, minus 2, minus 3. If the baby's head is lower than the ischial spines, you're plus 1 to plus 5 before she delivers. So it gives you an idea of where in the birth canal has the baby started to come down at all, or is it what we call belottable. Belottable would mean that I do a cervical exam and I touch that baby's head and lift it up and the baby's head is actually going to just pop up and down like that. So that means to me that baby's head is not engaged, it's not in the pelvis. So for this particular woman, the baby's kind of come down and station to minus one. What should you consider, what should your continued assessment include now that she's on mag sulfate? Yeah. Reflexes. Okay, so when are we going to do the reflexes? Before you start, great, to get a baseline, and then how often? About every hour, okay? It really does depend on hospital protocol. Some are hours, some are hour to two, but we can go with every hour. And what are you watching for with those reflexes? See if they decrease, okay? So that's what you're going to watch for. All right, so we know with reflexes, what else are we going to watch her for? Respiratory rate, what don't we want? A dramatic decrease in respiratory rate, good. What else are we going to watch? I'm sorry? Blood pressure? Okay, what's going to happen to the blood pressure? I'm sorry? Okay, remember there's going to be a slight vasodilation effect with the drug. Um, so again, we will monitor vital signs in general with a person with preterm labor. Another one? Change of mental status. Good. Level of consciousness. Because again, magnesium really tends to put this woman in a state of of almost total relaxation, for lack of a better word. Um, so we do have to watch her level of consciousness on this drug. Um, what else do we have to watch with regards to that she's 2 centimeters, 80% minus 1, and contracting every 3 minutes? Great. Well, what's her progression in labor? You know, is the drug working? You know, if we go and check this woman in two hours, is her cervix still two centimeters, 80% and minus one, or is it now four centimeters, 100% zero station? So again, we want to keep track of her labor progress, and hopefully she's not going to go any farther than two centimeters, 80% and minus one. What education do you need to share with the patient? Yeah. Okay, the question is, do you have to be worried about a person who has, in this particular case, 33 weeks with fetal lung maturity? Yes, you do. So what can we give her? Steroids, okay? So this is a candidate for steroids. Again, usually they give them up to about 34 weeks. What else? What education do you need to tell this mom? Okay, the anxiety factor um, can come in from the restlessness she may feel with the medication, but also the anxiety of possibly delivering a preterm infant is really going to come into play. So we need to teach her about that. We obviously need to teach her about what to expect on this medication, and it's nice to do it before you give it to her, because I tell you, when a woman experiences a hot flash from a medication, it's very uncomfortable. So it's easier to tell them up front with any type of patient education what they may expect. The other thing you need to do is with regards to education, you need to talk about the progression of labor, what could possibly happen, um, and also, you know, basically give her kind of feedback with regards to what you're doing. If you're doing a vaginal exam and you get three sonometers, you need to tell her what three sonometers means. Again, you're constantly providing patient education. 
Okay, we're going to go into post-mature pregnancy. This is on page 571. And post-mature pregnancy is basically a gestation of 42 weeks or 294 days or more from the first day of the last menstrual period. So again, you're going to find in a lot of labor and delivery units, a patient will come in and she's 40 weeks and 2 days and they're going to say she's post-dates. She technically is not post-dates until she hits 42 weeks or greater. What people will get induced for, for example, is that something else is going on. So it may be that they're noticing that the placenta isn't functioning as well, or that there's a decrease in amniotic fluid, um, or another factor besides just truly that she's post-date. Again, the morbidity and mortality does increase. Um, we do see an increase in oligohydramnios, which is decreased amniotic fluid. It may be that the person is leaking amniotic fluid, um, or that she has never leaked, but there's just a generalized decrease as pregnancy goes along. You also may see meconium stain fluid. Uh, this is when the baby or the fetus actually passes their first meconium stool in utero. Um, you will see that there is an increased chance of this, basically because of the mature GI system that the baby has. Placenta dysfunction, it develops calcifications. And you may actually see placental insufficiency. Um, so if we're talking about placental insufficiency on a fetal monitor, what might you see? Anybody? What type of D-cells? Placental insufficiency. Lates, good. Macrosomia may develop. Again, as the baby stays more and more in utero, the baby continues to grow. Um, medical management, you're going to have continued observation. It does not mean, like I said before, that you have to rush to deliver. You really want to do some antenatal testing. You could do a non-stress test, biophysical profiles, and we also utilize induction methods. I will talk about induction methods um, later on when we're in the interpartum period. Nursing care basically um, is similar to a patient in labor, depending on when they come in. You also want to give them education with regards to the testing that they're, they're um, going through. The next one is prolapse umbilical cord on page 571. Um, this is the passage of the umbilical cord into the vagina before the presenting part. It is most commonly seen with malpresentations or unengaged head, um, and you may see it with a large gush of fluid. Whenever a woman's bag of water breaks, one of the first things you want to do is check the fetal heart rate. Okay? So kind of make it an automatic thing. You baby, the bag of water breaks, you check the fetal heart rate. Um, it could, re, it could um, lead to cord compression, um, which can result in fetal hypoxia. And you may actually see some fetal bradycardia if the cord is being totally compressed and it has cut off the oxygen supply. What you want to do first is get help. Um, you do not want to leave the patient. Uh, you want to stay in the room. You want to try to um, put the mother in a position that is going to take the pressure off the presenting part. Um, so again, Trandellenburg or knee chest position. You want to administer O2, 8 to 10 liters. Again, remember in the pregnant client, 8 to 10 liters is pretty standard via face mask. Nasal prongs at 2 liters an hour really doesn't do anything for a pregnant client if you're trying to get ox extra oxygen to that baby. Um, get the patient to the delivery room for an emergency delivery. The other thing you're going to see here is that a healthcare provider usually does a vaginal exam and will lift the presenting part off of the cord so to release that compression. If the cord is protruding from the vagina already, so literally has come out of the woman's body, you want to wrap loosely in warm saline and a sterile towel and continue with the buff. Continue to get her into a different position. Get her to a delivery room because she has to get delivered right away. All right, we're entering the intrapartum period. Um, this is page 562. 562. What the labor process is, basically, is a process that leads to cervical dilation, effacement, descent, and the birth of the fetus. So actually, we're looking at that process to deliver this baby. There are certain factors associated with the labor process, and you'll see that there are five in general. The first one is passenger. 
And this is the fetus and placenta. Again, the placenta is a passenger as well. So we're going to look at the size of the head. We're also going to look at how that head is coming down into the um, uh, birth canal. Presentation, we want to look at the part that enters the canal first. So is this a vertex presentation? Is it a breach? Or is it a transverse lie? Or is it a chin presentation or a forehead presentation? Again, there's many different presentations. Majority of presentations are the vertex or head first position. The next one is lie, lie, and is it longitudinal or transverse? How is that fetus actually lying in utero? And again, this is all under passenger. Attitude, relationship of fetal parts to each other. So what kind of fetal position um, is occurring with regards to attitude? And position is the relationship of fetal part to the pelvic inlet. And these are things like ROA, or right occipital anterior, where you're looking to see how the baby's actually coming down. It also includes station and engagement. So that's the position. With regards to passageway, we look at the actual structure, which would be the vagina and the cervix, and also the different types of pelvises. The powers powers include the contractions and pushing efforts. So again, how are you going to get the baby out? What's the power behind getting that baby out? The next one should be um, position instead of placenta. It should be position. So again, what types of maternal positions can you put the mom in to help the process along? Um, so again, you have side lying, standing, squatting, etc. And then psychological response varies among patients. So again, they can be feeling very happy and joyful when they go into labor, or they can be feeling very free, uh, fearful, anxious, and apprehensive. Knowledge and relaxation does aid in the process, and we do know that through research. Um, with regards to the process itself, the actual cause is unknown. There are some theories involved and several contributing factors. So we're going to go into stages of labor. With regards to stages, there are four stages, and the first stage is broken down into phases. So stage one, you have your latent phase from zero to four centimeters, your active phase from four to eight centimeters, and your transition about eight to 10 centimeters. Your stage two is complete dilation to the birth of the infant. Stage three, from birth to delivery of the placenta. And stage four is the recovery period. What you're gonna find with the stages is that there are some time intervals given to the stages. Um, so again, you may see that if a person is pregnant for the first time, the stages will probably be longer lasting than if somebody is a multip. All right, we're going to go into fetal monitoring. But before we do that, let me go through some more information on the stages. Um, with regards to maternal behavior in the first stage, you may see, again, excitement and anticipation. And eventually, the woman becomes more concentrated as she gets into the active phase. And during the transition phase, you actually may experience a woman who's a little more irritable. And I think if you ask the significant other or coach to define irritable, you may not want to. You may not want to. The woman may also experience rectal pressure in that transitional stage as well. So during the first stage of labor, you're going to find that the woman may be walking, sitting upright, squatting, kneeling. She may be in a supine position, but again, you never want them flat on their back. Um, or she may be out into a rocking chair, she may be on a kangaroo ball for pressure. So again, the woman really should be moving around as much as possible to change position.
during the second stage of labor, which is complete dilation to the birth, obviously they're usually in one position. They can squat and sit and side, do it in the sideline position. Um, or you may see births in the lithotomy position, which is fairly traditional. However, it's not necessarily the best position to deliver a baby in. Um, you will also see that there are different types of pushing from spontaneous pushing that the woman has a complete urge to push to directed pushing, um, where people are encouraging the woman to push. Sometimes directed pushing you see more if the woman has an epidural anesthetic on board. You also may see open glottis pushing and instinctive pushing. With regards to the maternal response during the second stage, um, she may feel a period of relief, like it's, it's finally going to happen, um, may have the urge to bear down. Um, she may feel powerlessness to powerful, so it really depends on, on sometimes how long that stage takes to see how long it's going to take to get the baby out. Um, she concentrates on the birth. Um, she is aware of pain, obviously, um, and she does get very excited at the end of the stage. Now, again, there may be some women that are so exhausted by the time the baby's born that she may not be jumping for joy in her bed. It does not mean there's anything wrong. Um, it could truly mean that the woman is exhausted. Third stage, the birth of the infant to the delivery of the placenta. Um, again, this is a fairly short stage. It usually occurs in about five minutes. It can take up to an hour. Um, you definitely want to look at the uh, placenta for in, um, inspection, make sure all the um, pieces are there. Um, and check the umbilical cord insertion, etc. And then in the fourth stage is the immediate postpartum period and the transition to parenthood, which we will be focusing on a little bit later on. Um, fetal heart rate monitoring. Um, it is used to assess fetal response to uterine contractions and to permit timely intervention when signs of fetal compromise exist. Um, it is not universally accepted um, as a standard of care, um, but we utilize it the um, um, majority of the time in um, hospital settings. The types of monitoring, you'll see intermittent. Um, this could be done with a fetoscope or dog tone. And you also see continuous. That could be external um, monitoring or internal monitoring. With regards to how and when you have to monitor, in the first stage, the recommended is every 30 minutes. If the person is at risk, then you're monitoring the fetal heart rate every 15 minutes. This is the first stage, 30 minutes or every 15 minutes if the person's at risk. Once the person gets to the second stage, if there's no real risk factors, this is an uncomplicated um, birth, you're talking about every 15 minutes and then every five minutes if the person is at risk. So majority of the time, if the person is on a continuous fetal monitor, you're going to get a continuous fetal reading. Um, it's those women who are not on continuous monitoring that you have to pick up and do the intermittent monitoring. So what do we talk about with regards to terminology? Um, the first thing is that we obviously have a baseline fetal heart rate that usually runs between 110 and 160, and that's considered normal. And then we have variances off the baseline, the first one being bradycardia which is slowing of the heart, usually less than 110 beats per minute, and it usually lasts for more than 10 minutes. On the flip side, we have tachycardia, which is greater than 160 for 10 minutes. So again, you can have variances. You can have both types of variances um, in the same tracing as well. Variability is the fluctuation of the fetal heart rate. And it basically indicates an intact autonomic nervous system. So you can have periods of increased variability or decreased variability throughout the time frame that the mom is being monitored. And decreased variability may be drug related, but it also can be that the baby is sleeping in utero. So it can be a sleep cycle. Accelerations are basically a fluctuation um, of an increased fetal heart rate which is usually very reassuring. And then we have decelerations. And decelerations are broken into three categories. You're going to see early, variable, and late decelerations. Let me just go over these in a little more detail. 
Early decelerations reflect a vagal response. They reflect a vagal response or head compression. So they really mirror the contraction. They're usually symmetrical and smooth in appearance. And with regards to nursing care, um, usually you just document that the patient is having early decelerations. Variable decelerations are associated with umbilical cord compression. You're going to see variable shapes, U shapes, V shapes, W shapes, and again, that's where they get the name variable. They're variable in shape. They can occur with or without contractions. And the findings can be normal or they also can be non-reassuring depending on where they fall and how long they're taking to recover. And the last type of deceleration is the late deceleration related to utero placental insufficiency. These again are usually symmetrical and smooth and it's the timing that you have to be concerned about. It begins at the peak of the contraction and returns to the baseline after the, the completion of the contraction. So it is a non-reassuring finding. The depth of the um, late deceleration um, is not as significant as the timing of the decelerations. So again, just for a review, you have a fetal heart rate baseline, and these are accelerations, okay? Again, they accelerate off the baseline. You then have decelerations that actually will mirror the contraction, okay? So whether I turn this upside down, they mirror, they're smooth, this is an example of an early deceleration. Comes back to baseline once the contraction is back. Variable decelerations. Again, they are variable in how they appear. They can occur with a contraction, without a contraction. So again, they're variable in nature. And the last one would be late. Again, the timing is off, okay? It starts at the peak of the contraction, but it doesn't return to baseline until after that contraction's been back. So again, it's all in the timing of when you're actually looking at these on the fetal monitor. So what will your nursing responsibilities be, um, for example, if you saw late decelerations on a monitor? What do you think they'd be? Yeah. Give oxygen 8 to 10 liters, put her on her side. Correct. If she's on any types of Pitocin, you want to stop the Pitocin because Pitocin will actually be, is usually being given actually an inductive method. Um, or to help induce labor. Um, so you would stop the Pitocin. Anything else you may want to do if you saw late? What else can late decelerations be related to? Uteral placental insufficiency. If there's a decreased blood supply to the uterus, what may be causing that decreased blood supply? Position, okay. So we're going to get her on her side. What else could be causing it? Um, you can have utero placental fissure, like when we talked about abruption, correct? What else? What else do we sometimes give to patients that may cause hypotension as, uh, as a side effect? Uh, um, epidural anesthesia. So again, if you administer epidural anesthesia, um, and this woman has an epidural, and she's experiencing some hypotension, you may see late decelerations on the monitor related to hypotension. So think about it. If the normal blood pressure of the woman is 120 over 80, 
and now she's um, perfusing at you know 80 over 40, that baby's not getting enough blood either. So you may see late decelerations. And obviously the first thing you'd want to do is get her blood pressure up, and then you would see that the um, lates usually subside. Okay, good. You also may want to check the woman's cervix at the time too to see what she's doing. So how can you tell the difference between false labor and true labor? How do we tell the difference? A woman calls the floor and you're a nurse, to, you're a nurse on the floor and she says, I'm not sure I'm in labor. What are some of the questions you're going to want to ask her? Okay, how frequently are your contractions? So true labor may be the person really is in a, a regular pattern. False labor may be the patient says, oh, they're every three to 20 minutes. Okay, she may be more so in irregular labor or false labor. What else may have, give you some input? Yeah. Okay, if a woman says to you, you know, I, my bag of water broke, you know, most likely um, she can be starting the labor process. Like, um, but again, remember that she can break her bag of water and not actually be in labor, though. What else? Okay, what do the protections do with activity? Usually true labor, they're going to pick up with activity. False labor, they may um, go away with activity. Discomfort and where it's located may be a difference, depending on, you know, is it just that she's feeling it in her front? or in her back. Sometimes that will make a difference to some women. Um, bloody show, is she having a bloody show? Um, that may be significant. Um, is she dilating? Obviously we won't know until she gets to the hospital. Um, is she descending the same thing? Um, and the other thing would be sometimes women will receive a sedation to see if it will just help relax them a little bit and take them out of that um, pattern that they're in. Um, especially if they're not doing anything cervically. So what's your nursing care during labor and delivery? Um, you want to assess the contractions and the fetal heart rate patterns. You want to watch the maternal response to labor. How is this mom responding? How is she progressing in labor? That's going to be your cervical exams. Um, what is the client's knowledge? What is the client's pain or coping mechanisms? Again, this is something you're always going to want to assess. You're going to want to monitor vital signs and intake and output, teach breathing and relaxation techniques, provide continued education and support to both the client, the partner, and the family. So this is actually throughout labor, depending, you know, irregardless of what stage. You're really going to be following all of these. So your care during delivery, you want to assist the client into a desired position um, to give birth. You want to prepare her for the birth. You also want to monitor maternal vital signs and fetal heart rate patterns. Continue to instruct and assist with pushing. You may want to cleanse the perineal area. Provide support to the client and coach and care for both the mom and infant. So again, this is usually like your second stage management of what you have to do. And then nursing care after delivery in the immediate postpartum period, you're going to want to monitor vital signs, lochia, perineum, and fundal status. And I am going to go over all this again when we get to postpartum. Assess the infant's transition with APGARS, and Professor Gardner will be going over APGARS this afternoon with you. Assist with breastfeeding if desired. Assess and promote bonding. Administer Pitocin as ordered. And also assess maternal comfort. So again, you're constantly giving and providing nursing care during all of those stages. What we're going to talk about next is I want you to go to page 574, and we're going to talk about induction of labor. The induction of labor is the initiation of contractions prior to their spontaneous onset. Okay. Um, there are several methods that we utilize, include stripping of membranes, amniotomy, mechanical dilators, prostaglandins, and pitocin. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these methods. Um, stripping of the membranes is basically done during a vaginal exam. And what's happening is you want to kind of separate the choreoamniotic membrane from the wall of the, the, the cervix and lower uterine segment. What happens with stripping of membranes? There's a release of prostaglandins, okay? So that's what we're getting at. 
What you have to be careful of is that you don't break the bag of water. Um, so again, it is an attempt to induce labor and it does have an associated risk of possible infection. Amniotomy is when you break the bag of water. Um, it's artificial rupture of membranes. Once again, it releases prostaglandins. Once the patient has a broken bag of water, um, you can also um, insert internal um, monitoring devices for, for contractions or for fetal monitoring. Um, this does allow you to do that. But also, once she's ruptured, what is she at risk for? Infection, okay? So again, what are you going to be doing as part of your nursing care? Um, signs and symptoms of infection, but what are you also going to be monitoring? Temperature, okay? So every one to two hours, you're going to be taking this woman's temperature and watching for elevations. You're also going to be able to see the color of the fluid. Has the baby had a bowel movement inside? For example, meconium stained fluid. The normal color of fluid is pretty clear to slight yellowish. Mechanical dilators, these are some things like laminary tents. Um, also, the use of Foley catheters have been used to actually help dilate the cervix. Prostaglandins are some medications that are used to um, actual help with cervical ripening or cervical effacement. You want to soften that cervix up, and that's the use of prostaglandins. There are several on the market. Um, you do have to be careful for watching for overstimulation um, of contractions with the use of prostaglandins. And the last drug is that, is that you see is Pitocin. Pitocin is a synthetic hormone. It's used to stimulate uterine contractions. Um, basically, this drug is titrated. You start at a low dose and you titrate up until the person is having contractions about every two to three minutes of good intensity. There is an increased risk of hyperstimulation. And again, when a patient is on Pitocin, they're technically then considered high risk that you are monitoring the fetal heart rate much more often. So just for another case study, TA is a 38-year-old G2P1 at 38 weeks gestation who's receiving IV Pitocin for augmentation of her labor. Augmentation is different than induction. Induction basically means the woman is not contracting, not in labor, and we're going to help her with contractions. Augmentation is that she is in labor, but she needs a little more help. When administering this drug, what major adverse effect does the nurse have to be careful of? IV Pitocin, what does the nurse have to be the most careful of with regards to administering this drug? Go ahead. Okay, hyperstimulation. Good. Okay. Because again, the baby may not react well to hyperstimulation because you're decreasing the baby's oxygen reserve to get back um, to get any more to increase the oxygenation. Um, TA is receiving 12 milliunits a minute of pitocin. She is contracting every one to two minutes, and the fetal heart rate baseline is 160 to 168 with late deceleration. What actions should the nurse take? Go ahead. You can just raise your hand. Go ahead. Stop it. Stop the medication. Okay. Stop the Pitocin. What else are you going to do? Oxygen, 8 to 10 liters. What else? Left side. Good. What else? I'm sorry? You may want to increase her IV fluids, hydrate her a little bit. Um, the other thing, um, you may want to check her cervix to see how far along she is. Um, what is significant about that fetal heart rate baseline? Is that significant at all? It's a little bit higher than normal, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything wrong, but it just should heighten your awareness to keeping track of it. If you have a baby who, um, for example, has a very high fetal heart rate baseline, um, there can be several in, you know, reasons for that. And one of them can be maternal fever. Um, so again, you have to keep track of that, especially if she's ruptured. Um, with regards to the, the 38-year-old G2P1, what does that mean? G2P1. Good. She has already delivered one baby, and she's pregnant with this one. So she's been pregnant twice, 
and she's and she has one parody. Okay, we're going to talk about anesthesia and analgesia. So why is a pregnant woman in labor in pain? Um, first of all, there's visceral pain due to effacement and dilation. There's actual visceral pain. And then um, the abdomen radiates to lumbar region with regards to other types of pain. She also may experience a burning sensation. Um, if you talk to any pregnant women who have been in labor, um, they may describe pain very, very differently. Um, if you ask them on a scale of 0 to 10, which we do use pain scales in labor, um, what is your pain level at this point? You know, you may have a woman who is classic at one centimeter dilated and may say, oh, my pain is about a two. Um, compared to somebody who is nine centimeters dilated, they may say my pain on a scale of zero to 10 is a 14. Um, so again, they will give you those numbers. One thing you have to be careful of though is, is not to categorize everybody with regards to pain because we all have our own pain tolerance. So as much as we can use pain scales, I have to tell you that I still have a clear remembrance of this experience. A woman came into our labor and delivery unit. She was in a wheelchair. She was screaming at the top of her lungs, holding on to the, um, both bars, and she was also on one side. And basically, she was howling and that we just took her right to the DR. Well, we did a quick vaginal exam and she was one centimeter. Now again, if you think about the textbook, you would think, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But for that specific patient, her pain tolerance was where it was. Interestingly, once she found out she was one centimeter, she just went, oh. So it was kind of like, okay. So we had to move it forward a little bit. On the flip side, however, I have also cared for a woman who labored basically laying on her belly. Um, it's only happened once in my whole career. Um, where she laid almost flat on her belly, and she was silent. She didn't even want anybody to talk to her. Um, she was a multip, and literally at one point in time, she said to me, Trish, I think I have to push. And she rolled over, and she pushed the baby out on one push. And it was just phenomenal, because here this woman is completely dilated and not saying a word. So pain tolerance is very, very different. And you can never say to a person, you should be feeling or you shouldn't be feeling this much pain because it's irrelevant. You feel what you feel. So again, you will see those differences outside of what the textbook will describe to you with regards to pain. Um, when we look at analgesia and anesthesia, analgesics that are used include sedatives and narcotics. Um, and there are some listed in your book. Um, but we also see anesthetics um, such as nerve root blocks. Epidural has really become very popular. And also peripheral nerve blocks such as Pudendal. Um, so you can review them. Um, I would be cautious with regards to the use of epidural. Um, one of the side effects is hypotension. There's also been debate in the literature whether it truly slows down labor or not. And depending on the research you read, you'll get different opinions. Um, so again, it is a, a good method of um, pain control, and you will see it used. The other thing besides drug is non-pharmacological pain relief. Um, these may include water therapy, hypnosis, um, heat therapy, acupressure. Um, it could include um, breathing techniques with, re with regards to um, Lamaze method of breathing. Um, so there are also non-pharmacological methods to help a person relax. Um, operative obstetrical procedures. We're going to talk a little bit about episiotomy, assisted delivery, and cesarean section. Remember that primarily um, most deliveries are, are vaginal deliveries. The C-section rate has um, gone up to about 26% in our country, um, which um, is high. Um, some of that is related to repeat cesarean sections, malpresentations, of course all the reasons women do have a cesarean section, um, but also uh, there has been new 
um, issues with um, women just requesting a cesarean section, and that has been um, in the research and has been looked at with regards to our governing bodies. Um, so again, the C-section rate is elevated. Episiotomy is the incision made into the perineum. Um, usually in this country, you see more midline is the most common. Um, and again, it just assists with um, a, space, a space issue, basically. Um, assisted delivery can be vacuum or forceps. And both are used for, again, indication is basically to assist the birth of the infant. There are complications associated with each one. Uh, the cesarean delivery, um, you will see um, that even though the rate is increased, we still have care in the pre-op, the interpartum, and the post-op that um, we should really discuss. So again, FB is a 26-year-old G1P0 at 39 weeks gestational age who presents for a scheduled C-section for a breach presentation. Please discuss her pre-op, intra-op, and post-op care. So again, what we're talking about right now is a primate who shows up and she has a breech presentation. Usually, if it's a primate, um, they will not let the person deliver vaginally if it's your first, um, if it's your first delivery. A multiple who shows up with a breech and has delivered a fetus um, through her vagina may have an increased chance of delivering a breech through her vagina. So again, if we talk about the care. Um, with regards to pre-op care, what needs to be included in pre-op care of a person undergoing a cesarean section? Yeah. Great. Education on the procedure and everything she's going to experience. Good. Yeah. Last time she ate. Okay, we are going to want to know that with regards to administration of anesthesia. Good. In um, pre-op care. Shaving, okay, you're going to want to shave the top of her pubic hair. What else? Good, informed consent is going to be important. What else are we going to want to know? What else do we have to do as part of our interventions? What does she need? Yeah. Okay, right now she needs an IV catheter, we need to draw blood, um, and she also needs a Foley catheter because we're going to want to decompress that bladder while we're, while we're doing the cesarean section. Um, she may not need antibiotics right now, um, they're usually not traditionally just given prophylactically, um, but if the woman should need them, they would be available. Anesthetic, um, obviously we have to get her ready to receive some form of anesthesia. Um, and then emotional support is very significant at this point as well. Okay, now we're intra-op. What are our nursing goals? You're the circulating nurse in the room. What do you need to do to care for that patient? Yeah. Monitor her vital signs, which you're also going to do pre-op. Um, pre-op, you're also going to see what that baby's doing, right? Okay, we're going to have her on a monitor for a little while. So intra-op, monitor her vital signs. What else? Intra-op. Yeah. Good. So you want to keep an I and O on her. An I and O also includes the amount of bleeding. Um, also, you're going to be very careful of safety in that room at this point in time. Um, neonatal care will become your responsibility. Um, positioning of the woman will become your responsibility as well, and it is a team effort. Okay, in the immediate postpartum period for a cesarean section, what are you going to assess for? She now is in back in the room, and you're the nurse taking care of her. What are you going to want to assess? Okay, you're going to want to take a look at that incision, make sure it's clean and dry. What else are you going to want to look for? Her fundus, okay, the fundus is basically the top of the uterus. You're going to want to feel where that fundus is in relationship to her umbilicus and measure it that way. Um, you're also going to want to feel the um, consistency of the fundus. If it's soft and boggy, what do you want to do? 
massage it, okay? You definitely want a firm fundus. Okay, what else do you want to do? Yeah. Monitor urinary output. She's going to have a Foley catheter in, so we're going to have to keep track of that. What else? Her bleeding, correct. She's still going to have lochia, even though she's a cesarean section, so she still will have vaginal bleeding to be monitored. Vital signs with a temperature, great. Okay, you're going to want to monitor the bonding and the relationship between mom and babe. Return of sensation with any type of anesthetic she used. Did she have an epidural? Did she have a spinal? Or did she need general anesthesia where that sensation is going to come back real quick? What else? Pain. Okay, where is she with pain? She may come right out of the delivery room and on a scale of 0 to 10, she says, uh, 0, I have no pain, um, which is fine. Um, versus, you know, my pain's about a 5. Um, so again, you do still, to, do still need to monitor pain management. Um, the other thing um, we're going to do now is go right into the postpartum period, and that's on page 582. Um, with regards to the postpartum period, there's definitely physical changes that go on. Um, you're going to see it in a reproductive system, um, and again, we started discussing some of these already. Um, the fundus will have to be assessed usually every 15 minutes for an hour and then every hour and then eventually, um, you know, depending on the hospital protocol, four to eight hours. Um, you also want to assess for lochia, which is the amount of vaginal bleeding. You not only want to look at the, um, the color of the bleeding, but also are there clots um, and how often is this woman changing a prairie pad. Um, the breasts will have physical changes as well. Obviously, um, they um, have gotten bigger with pregnancy, um, and depending on what type of infant feeding the woman is going to do, um, may actually be starting to be utilized for a feeding mechanism in the immediate postpartum period. With regards to the abdominal wall, um, you will see that um, the abdominal wall will actually start to go back into place. Um, cardiovascular um, blood volume will decrease. Um, WCs can elevate to 20 to 25,000. That's important to know. Um, what you will find is if, a, if the woman develops a temperature about 100.4 in the first 24 hours, it's not as significant as if she developed it later on. Um, so again, a temp after the first 24 hours is more significant, obviously depending on what the temp is. Um, what you will also find with regards to elimination is that she may have, um, experience diaphoresis um, as well as diuresis, um, and you will see that she may have a, a hard time um, voiding if she has been catheterized before or if she's ended up with um, some perineal swelling or episiotomy or a tear. It may be a little more difficult for her to void for the first time. The initial bowel movement can be an issue, again, depending on the... Um, um, extensive repair that she might have received. And the gastrointestinal, um, basically um, the woman at this point in time um, is usually looking for something to eat. Um, most um, institutions will keep patients fairly on the lighter side with regards to allowing them some fluids in labor, um, but they're really not eating a whole lot. So it may come down to the patient really is starting to um, want to meet her nutritional requirements. Psychosocial changes are pretty significant. Um, the woman not only has to um, have a, her own maternal adjustment, but she also has to adapt to being a parent. Um, so you will see bonding, um, and bonding, again, is the interaction, um, the identification, the claiming of this baby to be her own, and also central responses, such as voice and touch and odor and smell. The maternal adjustment periods, um, there are periods that have been labeled the taking in period. Um, this is usually about one to two days after delivery. Um, this is a stage where the mom is still fairly on the dependent side, kind of more concerned of what's going on with her, her response to labor, um, what's happened to her with delivery. Um, she may need assistance with personal hygiene, etc. 
Then you go into the taking hold phase. It's a little bit later, maybe days three to ten. Um, the mom more so identifies the self and the infant um, separately. Is starting to be um, more careful with regards to caring with the caring for the baby and herself. Identifies her needs with regards to knowledge of both herself and her baby. And then you have the letting go stage, um, which again can extend into like the fifth or sixth week. Um, and she focuses on the new lifestyle, the family unit. Um, so again, things really do progress with regards to the psychosocial. So what's your responsibilities with regards to postpartum care? Um, first of all, you want to do a complete physical assessment. Um, vital signs, fundus, lochia, perineum. Again, if that perineum is swollen or the woman received an episiotomy, you really want to try ice packs for the first 12 hours, and then you can switch to heat. Um, you want to check the incision if she did have a cesarean section. You want to check her breasts um, and also her elimination pattern. Um, you want to identify psychosocial adjustment, um, issues with parenthood, you also want to supply her with information with regards to infant care, infant feeding, and safety. Um, safety is a very big issue in hospitals right now with regards to identification of that infant to the mother. It is part of the nurse's role. Patient education will focus on not only what they experience in the hospital setting, but also what they need to know once they go home. And then follow-up care for the self and infant will continue. There's also a list of postpartum complications that you will see, um, and I'm going to go through a, um, several of these. This is on page 586. The first one we're going to talk about is postpartum hemorrhage. Now, postpartum hemorrhage is really an excessive blood loss. Um, you may see uterine atony. Um, lacerations or uh, retained placenta actually leading to the cause of postpartum hemorrhage. What you would want to do if the woman was excessively bleeding would be to massage her fundus to make sure it's nice and firm and then after that you have to deal with specific issues that may be causing the hemorrhage. So again if that uterus firms up nicely and the bleeding stops it could be that she just had a period of acne versus she's nice and firm now, the bleeding's continuing, maybe she has retained placenta or a laceration. So you have to look further into a postpartum hemorrhage. Thrombophlebitis, um, again with thrombophlebitis, you're dealing with um, a thrombus. You want to check the Holman sign, and you want to check her calves for any swelling or pain. And with regards to prevention, you want early ambulation. And sometimes early ambulation with women who have undergo a cesarean section may be a little tricky. And why I say that is, is that um, women have gone through major abdominal surgery with a cesarean section. Um, so again, they may not want to or feel like getting up right away, but it is very important to get them mobile, not only to prevent thrombophlebitis, but also to prevent any fluid collection in their lungs. Um, with regards to infections, there are several postpartum infections that can occur. Um, endometritis, you can have a wound infection, you could also have mastitis. <coughs> mastitis you don't really see in the immediate postpartum period in the hospital. Mastitis is something the woman may experience when she goes home. With regards to infection, you're looking at um, assessing for any foul smelling um, or increased lochia. Um, temperature elevations, perineal redness, um, pain on urination may be a sign, um, redness or discharge from the incision, incision site. So again, think of all your types of infections that could occur because of the labor process and delivery. Again, the woman would usually need fluids and antibiotics if this does occur. Um, urinary tract infection the same way, you know, if she's complaining of urinary tract type of um, manifestations to giving you some insight into infection, um, you're going to have to follow through probably getting urinary uh, urine culture and send that. And she may also need fluids, hydration, and also antibiotics. Um, with regards to the mastitis, it is usually unilateral. 
Um, the woman may notice redness or tenderness or a hardness of her breast. Um, she may also experience chills, malaise, and temp. Um, and she really should increase her PO fluids at this point in time and also needs um, antibiotics for mastitis. Mastitis is very different than a, a blocked duct. A blocked duct is something that the woman may actually feel a hardness or um, a redness in a specific area that she can massage that blocked duct and actually release it. So it is a little bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, basically, sometimes to get the most sterile specimen. Um, so again, I understand your concern at this point in time. Many times they'll get a clean catch urine, um, but unfortunately, sometimes the, the procedure, because there may be a lot of lochia involved, etc., you're going to have a cup full of a lot of, of, of lochia and maybe clots, etc. So um, sometimes they'll do the foley um, just to get a, the cleanest catch they can for the specimen. Postpartum depression um, or psychosis. Remember that. Um, this is all um, somewhat of a timing thing. Postpartum blues really occur about days three to 10. I don't think this is in your book. I'm just kind of off the cuff. Postpartum blues is really days three to 10. Um, and it, it usually resolves on its own. And it's just the, the woman dealing with the transition of going um, into motherhood. Depression, on the other hand, does occur in about 10 to 15 percent of women. It does last for several weeks, and it, and it does need to be treated. It could be treated with counseling or a combination of medication and counseling. And last, uh, with regards to um, psychosis, um, it occurs rarely in one to two per thousand births, but I think we're hearing about it a little bit more and more these days. Um, it does have a high reoccurrence with subsequent pregnancies and assessment, treatment, and medication. Um, really is vital um, for women going through um, psychosis. Um, let's take a short 10 minute break and then I'm going to finish up. Okay. Any questions on the intrapartum or postpartum piece? Oh, sure. The question is, can I talk about fundal heights depending on gestational age? Um, during the pregnancy period, um, we utilize fundal heights just to give us an idea of where the baby's growth is. So again, first of all, it's a rough estimate. It's not an exact science because it's very subjective. What's going to happen is, with the mom, um, that's her belly button, by the way, um, which sometimes, you know, goes away with pregnancy. Um, her symphysis pubis is here, um, so you have to imagine the, the, the pregnancy being here. What we do is we measure the fundal height with a measuring tape of sonometers. So you're going to put the end of the measuring tape on the top of the symphysis pubis here, and then you're going to take the measuring tape to the top of the fundus and get a number. So say, for example, right now, if that top of the fundus is at the belly button, it usually correlates to about 20 weeks gestation. Okay? So that's kind of a landmark. Right above the symphysis pubis is about 12 weeks. At the umbilicus is about 20 weeks. And then what's going to happen is, as you get further along in pregnancy, um, 40 weeks may be as high as right below the xiphoid process. And believe it or not, 36 weeks may be under that because the baby kind of settles in the pelvis. Um, so again, I just said that backwards and I just caught it. You're going to find that 36 weeks may be higher and 40 weeks it actually may settle into the pelvis. So what does that mean with regards to sonometers? If I do a fundal height, and the woman, let's say, presents, and she should be about 32 weeks gestation, and I do the fundal height measurement, and I get 36 sonometers, she's now measuring greater than dates. Okay, so she, her dates are saying she's 32. My fundal height is saying she's 36. Well, what it's going to do to you 
as a nurse is say, wait a minute, something's off here. So you may think of what? What could possibly make that fundus bigger? Multiple gestation. What else? Polyhydramnios, good extra fluid. Anything else? Big baby, okay? Maybe she has a big baby in there. Incorrect age. Maybe her dates aren't correct. So again, it's giving you some like, oh, I wonder what it can be. And it leads you down the road to saying, you know what? Why don't we get an ultrasound? Okay, let's see what the estimated um, um, gestational age is via ultrasound. Let's see it. Let's check the fluid. Let's see if there's one baby in there versus two, three, or four. On the other hand, it can go the opposite way. Here a woman presents at 32 weeks, and her fundal height is 28 weeks. So again, you may be starting to think about intrauterine growth restriction, or maybe oligohydramnios, or what other parameters can make this measurement not accurate. And once again, it sends you down to line up. Let's look at this a little closer, probably an ultrasound. Now, the other thing I have to throw out, though, that can really kind of um, affect this is the woman's size and how she's carrying. You may have a woman who's four foot nine, and again, depending on how she's carrying, it may not be an exact science. So it can be off a couple of weeks or two. On the other hand, you can have a woman who's five foot nine and carries very high. And again, her fundal height may be 44 centimeters, and again, it may be a very large baby's measuring out, and lo and behold, she delivers, and the baby isn't that big. So it really, it's a rough estimate, gives you some idea, but it should send you down the road that if it's kind of off by several weeks, it kind of sends you to, you know what, let's look at this a little bit further. Okay. Does that answer your questions? Any other questions? Interpartum? Postpartum, yeah. Do you mean, the question was, if the woman is going to have a cesarean section, is it inappropriate to start talking about the postpartum experience? What you're going to find is, is that um, women will retain a certain amount of information. Um, and usually, um, with pregnancy, they're kind of looking forward to the next step, however, not too far along. So, for example, if you have a woman that we had in the case study, she's a breech presentation, she's a primate, um, she's going to have a cesarean section. Usually, when she comes in, I'm going to be talking to her about all the things of what I'm going to be doing for her now and surgery-wise. And it may not be until the immediate postpartum period I go back in the room and I say, okay, now what I'm going to be doing is, so sometimes you have to be careful of too much information with regards to what does she really need to know to get through that point in time. So um, I think it's very individual. You may have some women that are like, you know what, I just need to know what I need to do right now versus, you know, I, I want to know, you know, when the baby's six months old, will I have to give whatever. Um, so everybody's a little bit different. Uh, but usually you can kind of tell by what kind of questions the woman is answering. Um, with regards to where she is in the process. Um, what we're going to start with now um, is infertility and fertility conditions. Um, infertility, um, this is on page 608, 608. Infertility basically means a prolonged time to conceive, okay? Um, there are tests that are done, and basically we look at both female inability and male inability. Now with regards to female, some of the tests that we look at is, um, we'll start with basal body temperature. Again, it's very non-invasive and we'll see if we can see any patterns with regards to basal body temperature. Hormone analysis may be the next step because it would be a blood draw. So again, let's look at the woman's levels with regards to hormones. And then a hysterosalpingography is looking at the tube patency. So again, this is a type of x-ray almost, if you will, um, with some dye, that we want to see the patency of the tubes, because maybe it's that one of those tubes isn't patent, and therefore the egg is never even getting down. Um, pelvic ultrasound can also assist with looking for any um, structural problems or malformations. 
Um, with regards to the male, um, usually the first test is a sperm analysis, um, where again the sperm is analyzed not only for um, the number of sperm, but also for um, things like motility. Um, so again, that is again a non-invasive type of test. The management of infertility really depends on the cause. Um, so again, you're looking at if there's an ovarian factor involved, a tubal factor involved, a uterine factor involved. Again, the woman may have to go through several steps of trying to correct um, those issues before she can even attempt getting pregnant. On the other side, um, the male, the same thing. There are certain male factors, um, gonadal dysfunction, for example, or a varicele that the, the male partner will have to correct um, before the possibility of getting pregnant. Um, there are alternatives, obviously, to conceiving naturally. Um, some of these include, obviously, correction of the problem, but also administration of certain hormones. Um, one of them may be like uh, Clomid that's been used, um, or assisted reproductive technologies. And this is the terminology giving to procedures such as in vitro fertilization, um, where the egg and sperm um, obviously are united outside um, of the uterine cavity and then um, placed back in. Um, GIF procedure is gamete intrafallopian transfer. Um, the fertilization takes place in the actual tube. And then the ZIF procedure is zygote intrafallopian transfer, where the zygote is placed back in the tube. Um, GIFT and ZIFT you don't see used as commonly as the intra, intra, ah, in vitro fertilization. There's also donor sperm, there's also donor egg, um, and adoption is an alternative. And another alternative um, is, is not to proceed with having children. It is an alternative. Um, interesting, too, before I go on, is that um, the assisted reproductive technologies um, really only account for about 1% of all live births. And some people through the media, et cetera, um, really look at this as something that's booming. Um, but in reality, um, the chances of getting pregnant using um, assisted reproductive technologies um, aren't extremely high. So depending on the woman's age, depending on what the couple are bringing to the table, it may actually affect the chance of the woman being successful with assisted reproductive technologies. Um, contraceptive options are on page 609, um, and now we're going to controlling fertility. Um, there are several contraceptive options, and I know that um, you're probably familiar with several of them. The first one being natural methods, um, such as basal body temperature, um, trying to figure out when um, the person might have ovulated. Usually what you will see is a slight decrease in temperature and then the increase during the time of ovulation. Um, so there are certain types of um, thermometers that the person can um, purchase. Um, the other method, obviously, is the cervical mucus method, where there is a change in the cervical mucus that the woman can keep track of, and also um, a combination of the two. Um, the next one would be something like mechanical barrier methods. Um, these are things like condoms, um, cervical caps, uh, sponges, um, that are used to actual uh, decrease the chance of the sperm getting to the egg. Hormone therapy, your oral contraceptives, um, the patch, the ring, um, are hormonally controlled, administered to the woman to, to kind of uh, decrease the chance of pregnancy um, with regards to preventing ovulation and pregnancy together. Intrauterine device or IUDs are used. Again, it's almost like um, um, it's not quite a barrier method in that it kind of creates uh, an inflammation process, so it's not the best environment um, for an egg to implant. Um, then sterilization is uh, another option with regards to um, a vasectomy or a tubal ligation um, in the woman and a vasectomy in the male. Termination of pregnancy, um, this was covered um, in the beginning of the book, and now it's kind of covered again here with regards to general information of termination of pregnancy, um, there are different techniques used depending on the gestational age. 
Um, you will see that during the um, first trimester, you see more vacuum extraction and dilation and curatage being used. Um, and then second trimester, you get more into the saline administration and prostaglandins. So again, depending on the gestational age, maybe um, depending on the technique that is used. Um, there are many physical and psychosocial needs of the patient, especially psychosocial needs that have to be addressed. Um, and also patient education, not only um, preparing for the procedure, um, but also um, the education that has to go along with following the procedure as well. We're now into menstrual disorders. Um, there are several listed in your book, um, starting with um, dysmenorrhea, uh, which is pain associated with menstruation. I'm on page 612. Amenorrhea is the absence of menstruation. Menorrhagia is the excessive menstrual flow. Menorrhagia is the intracyclic bleeding. And then lastly, you have endometriosis. And that's basically where endometrial tissue is found outside the uterine cavity. So depending on the disorder is going to be dependent on what types of interventions can be done. And those are listed in your book. Um, infectious disorders is the next category. Um, with infectious disorders, we're dealing with many of the sexually transmitted diseases or infections. So you may see this written as STD or STI. Again, you need to um, utilize assessment with sexual history and social practices, um, also a physical examination for any signs and symptoms. Um, sexually transmitted infections are very common with regards to a national health problem. Um, and the majority of sexually transmitted infections occur between um, women and men of age 15 to 24. Um, just to read down a few of these and to go over a few of the points, um, the first one listed there is herpes. And what you will find with herpes is that um, it is caused by the herpes simplex virus. Um, there are about 1 million new cases each year, and it occurs in about every 1 to 5 people over the age of 12. Um, so it is an, an infection that is very common. Um, we most see the, the increase right now is occurring in, in teens and young adults. There is no actual cure, but there is obviously remission um, with use of, of drugs such as acyclovir. Um, and again, um, sits baths and good hygiene are also things we can utilize as well. Um, with regards to herpes in pregnancy, there is an increased transmission of the herpes virus if the woman has an active lesion. Um, so if she has any active lesions, they will do a cesarean section. If there are no lesions or prodromal signs, then the patient can deliver vaginally. So this is really determined once the woman goes into labor, whether she's going to need a, a vaginal delivery or cesarean section. Um, chlamydia is the next one on the list. There are about 4 million new cases a year. Um, it is a very um, frequently reported infection in the United States. Um, and it is strongly associated with gonorrhea infections. So you will see kind of gonorrhea and chlamydia um, going hand in hand. Um, most women are asymptomatic, which is important to know, and the diagnosis is made on vaginal culture um, and also can be further looked at with DNA and genetic tests. Um, you do want to treat the woman. Um, again, treatment of choice, azithromycin um, um, is, the, is the drug. You also need to treat the partner as well. Um, gonorrhea, um, this basically is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, gram-negative organism. Uh, about 50% of infections in women are asymptomatic, but you may see some mucoperial and vaginal discharge or painful urination. Um, it is assessed by or diagnosed by culture, um, and you will see that it is um, treatable with ceftriaxone. The next one is syphilis. 
Um, syphilis is still around and has been around for quite some time. Um, it is caused by a spirochete. What you will see is that there are certain stages of syphilis from primary, secondary, latent to tertiary. Um, and there are some um, diagnostics including an RPR and a VDRL. Um, treatment is penicillin G. And again, the partner needs to be treated as well. The next one is trichomonas. Um, it's present in about 30% of sexually active women, so it is very common. It's a protozoan. The symptoms include frothy, green, bubbly discharge, vaginal itching, genital tenderness, and possible vaginal bleeding. Um, it is made diagnostically under a microscope, um, utilizing a saline wet prep. And the treatment right now is metro, uh, metronidazole. Um, and again, you also have to watch with alcohol with taking this drug. Um, Candida albicans, um, what you will find is it is caused by a yeast-like organism. Um, it is an overgrowth. Um, and the treatment is topical with um, gynolotrimin or microstatin. And then bacteria vaginosis. Um, it says vaginitis in the book, but you will see it as vaginosis as well. Um, occurs in about 40 to 50% of women. Um, it's sexually associated, but not treated, transmitted sexually. Um, it is an overgrowth of vaginal orgasms, um, and symptoms include a strong fish-like odor, or white or gray discharge, or burning on urination. And again, it's treated with metronidazole um, or clindamycin. Um, the other one that's not listed there that I just want to touch on a little bit is HPV, or human papillomavirus, HPV. Um, otherwise known as genital warts or condyloma. Genital warts or condyloma. And again, it's not in your book. Um, why I'm bringing this up is, is that um, there, it's transmitted 94% um, of the time. And there is no cure for it. And there can be regrowth. And it is a virus. Um, but why it's so significant is it really does come into play with regards to um, being positive on pap smears and may lead, may lead the woman to um, experience cervical cancer. Um, so again, it is important with regards to picking that up and then following through. So with regards to the clinical finding, um, the woman may not present with warts or condyloma. Um, there are several different types of HPV, um, and some are asymptomatic. Um, so you will see that a pap smear is the diagnostic, and a colposcopy is usually how it's treated. Um, it also can be treated with the lead procedure um, or cryosurgery. Um, reproductive cancers um, are kind of grouped together here. And I'm still on page 614. Um, the first one is the breast cancer. Um, Usually, with regards to breast cancer, um, there is a chance of one in eight over the lifetime of getting breast cancer. But again, you have to remember it's over the lifetime. Um, there has been an association with a gene, um, but it's not. Um, it's more so not associated with the gene, and it happens at all ages. Most breast tumors are benign. And the signs and symptoms you have to be um, aware of is maybe a thickening felt by the patient or provider, a lump or swelling or distortion of the breast, dimpling of the skin, retraction of the nipple. Um, there could be pain. And with, with regards to finding, it may be through a self-breast exam it's found, a provider's exam, a mammogram or an ultrasound. Um, so again, we do have some um, means of picking up breast cancer. The treatment depends on the type as well as um, the size, etc. Um, so usually you're finding the woman um, experiences a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, and then it may be followed by either radiation, chemotherapy, or hormonal therapy. 
And an example of the hormone therapy is tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is also being used as a preventive type of drug for women who are maybe increased risk for having breast cancer. Um, the next one on the list is cervic, cervical cancer. It is detected by pap smear, again, commonly associated with the HPV virus. Signs and symptoms, again, usually there's really no outward symptoms. It's picked up on the pap smear. Some women do experience, however, abnormal vaginal bleeding. The treatment may, may include um, colposcopy, laser surgery, the LEAP procedure, and that LEAP should be L-E-E-P, not L-E-A-P. That's L-E-E-P. It's probably, it might not be in your book. Um, it could be that the woman may need a hysterectomy or radiation and chemotherapy. Uterine cancer or endometrial cancer, what you will find is that um, the signs and symptoms include abnormal uterine bleeding is usually the telltale sign. Um, the woman may actually have some pelvic pain as a late stage sign. Treatment options, usually a hysterectomy and possibly radiation or chemotherapy. Many times these women do find that with a hysterectomy alone. Um, ovarian cancer, it's a very late presentation. The biggest problem with ovarian cancer besides, you know, the disease itself is that we really don't have any true um, screening tools that have been very useful in picking up ovarian cancer. What you will find is that the signs and symptoms are very vague. Um, there's no early warning signs. It could be an enlarged abdomen or feeling very bloated. It could be vague digestive disturbances like GI disturbances or pelvic pressure or leg pain. So again, very vague signs and symptoms. The diagnosis is usually made um, by palpating the ovary. They may feel a firm nodular mass. They sometimes will do an ultrasound or a CAT scan or MRI um, or, or a lab procedure to, to get a biopsy of the ovary. The treatment option, hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo oophorectomy and radiation and chemo. And the last one is vulva cancer. You're going to see some pruritic type lesions. Um, you don't see vulva cancer um, as often. Um, and local excision and vulvectomy may be the treatment. Um, we're on page 615 for menopause. Menopause is the cessation of regular menses for one year. Um, you do see a decrease in estrogen and progesterone. Um, physiologic effects may include hot flashes, vaginal dryness, mood swings, or sleep disturbances. Interventions include natural remedies um, and also some hormonal therapy. Um, hormonal therapy has been very controversial over the last couple of years. Um, and it is recommended that if they are on hormonal therapy for some of the signs and symptoms that they are only on it for a short period of time. Um, with regards to osteoporosis, um, what you will find with osteoporosis is that it's a decrease in bone mass. Um, the contributing factors is menopause based on the fact that there's a decrease in estrogen, also a decrease in calcium intake, and, and smoking actually has a relationship to osteoporosis. Um, bone mass density does decline after age 30, and the prevention can include exercise and calcium intake. There are also some drugs that, be, that can be used for osteoporosis prevention. Um, such, a, such a drug like um, raloxifene um, is an example, or Fosamax. Um, with regards to the um, cystocele or rectocele, um, women may be at risk for um, developing a cystocele or rectocele. There are herniations of the anterior and posterior walls of the vagina. 
Um, so again, it's mainly based on the sequela of childbirth injuries. Um, prolapse of the uterus is another um, consequence. Um, you can see where um, some women will utilize pessaries to actually um, take some pressure off and it's a supporting device to keep that uterus in place. Um, and that's all I have for now. Okay, well good luck with your NCLEX RN exam. I wish you all well um, and good luck with your chosen nursing career.